Hello, my friends, coming to you from Studio A here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. It's time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Stacy, it's part two of Vines this week. Looking forward to it. That much loved, but maybe frustrating vine and flower clematis. We get a lot of questions on that. I, yeah, second to hydrangeas, uh, clematis take the cake. Well, and there we go. We start right off the bat with uh, pronunciation. Yes, but yeah. they're both correct. So I do tend to say clematis, and uh, <laughs> I, but I also, I also alternate. Like I, I, I generally say clematis, but I also think I sometimes say clematis. But it, it sounds great. Your clematis sounds better than my clematis. I think clematis I, uh, is a Midwest thing. Clematis is kind of like British, European. It is probably a little bit more British, but you know, I it's like what I've heard around my peers in horticulture. And you know what I always say when we talk about pronunciation of plant names, yes. as long as you walk out of the garden center with a plant you want, you did it, you did it right. So <laughs> well, there's I, no need to lose sleep over clematis versus clematis. That's right. I've heard them all. Cle- Matus, Clematis, whatever. I beg your garden. What did you just say? <laughs> whatever. You know, words are like that, though. And who am I talking to? I mean, you would know, Stacy. And I think of words like uh, leisure or is it leisure, right? Yeah. Or schedule. When people say schedule, that really bugs me. Yeah, my fifth grade teacher used to say that. So I, <laughs> it, sounds, it still sounds weird to me. If we go somewhere, is it a route or a route? Is it data that we amass or data? Uh, well, like, like we said last week, let's call the whole thing <laughs> off. A potato, potato, right? And again, as long as you are getting the thing that you want at the end of the of the day, then it's fine. You can't, you know, no one has a right to tell you you're mispronouncing it. Speaking of which, have you ever watched that 1937 movie with Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers when they dance on roller skates? That I have not seen the movie, but I am very familiar with the song. Watch the YouTube video. It's All fabulous right. to watch. George and Ira Gershwin, yes, I think, course. wrote the song, the of course, writing. and Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. What are we talking about? Oh, clematis. <laughs> We're talking about clematis. Let's do this. I call clematis, Stacy the mailbox plant because yes. that's where everybody puts them, right? They love it. It's a classic, and, you know, it looks great. It's the, it's the perfect uh, structure that most people have ready-made. Uh, to to grow a clematis on, and they don't have to worry about, oh, I I have to find a fence or a trellis or this or that or the other. I got the mailbox, and it needs a little gussying up. And of course, just like hydrangeas, we have the old the whole old wood, new wood conundrum to uh, to deal with. Um, and when I was first starting out in the horticulture industry, I was taught that there's group one and group two and group three and I created uh, uh, as to how to prune clematis, right. these different groups. And uh, what I did was I just invented group four, and that is do nothing and just see what happens. That's, you know what? When in doubt, don't prune. That is my <laughs> stand. whether we're talking about clematis, hydrangeas, anything else in your yard. This is perfect advice for right now, by the way. If you do not know what, if you should prune something, why you should prune something, just don't. Just put the pruners down and walk away ah, walk because away. you're going to cause a lot less damage not pruning than pruning. And, you know, most of the time if you misprune something, and this includes clematis, the worst that's going to happen is you won't have flowers that year. And that's disappointing. And sure, you want to kick yourself, but you get over it. Sure. You learn a great lesson. You never forget those lessons. Right. I know that it certainly <laughs> happened to me. Um, but, yeah, it, it is confusing with clematis how you prune them. Um, and those different groups, I think, though they intend to simplify it, uh, often make people more confused because then they don't necessarily know what group their clematis is in. The tags don't necessarily say so. So on our tags for the Proving Winners Color Choice Clematis, we just put the pruning recommendations that we recommend for each variety. Yeah, and I find with the clematis or clematis with Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, you've taken a lot of the complication out of the pruning because uh, some of these varieties, like we've talked about Sweet Summer Love, mm -hmm. uh, maybe pruning once a year, pruning it back in spring. In early spring, yeah. And then letting it just take off to the rate. You've taken this same. group one, group two, group four thing out of the equation, and it's much easier. 
Right. And it does, ultimately, it does come down to whether they bloom on new wood, old wood, or both is, is how you're treating them. Um, and we have that information, you know, on our website as well. So we do try to simplify it. But, um, you know, many a person has certainly mispruned their clematis and found themselves flowerless and sad. Mm-hmm. And that's not a good thing. But don't beat yourself up. It was a learning experience. Yeah. Clematis are, I call them socializers. They like to hang out and entertain people, whereas their roots are loners. That's kind of the way I look at it. And the roots like to be shaded or mulched, and the tops like to be in the spotlight, in yeah. the sun. Is that a good analogy? Yes, feet in the shade, head in the sun is the old adage for success with clematis. And, uh, you know, I, I'm going to talk about this in Plants on Trial because, of course, today's Plant on Trial is a clematis to go with the theme. Um, but clematis have the weirdest roots. Have you ever seen clematis oh, yeah. roots? They right. are just plain bizarre. Mm-hmm. There's really <laughs> no other plant like them. I mean, they're ropey. They're thick and fleshy, and so those roots are just so sensitive to heat, to overly wet soil, and you really, if you can keep clematis roots happy, then your clematis is happy. It's really that simple. And that's one of the keys. And then to add to the struggle with this much-loved but many times frustrating plant is something called clematis wilt, Oof. or clematis wilt, <laughs> if I phrase it that way, uh, because, you know... It, I guess if we get to the bottom line, it's a fungal disease, and yet people loosely term these problems with clematis as wilt. In some mm-hmm. cases, it can be drought. It can be, uh, you know, soil that they're planted in, or as you mentioned, the roots being too warm. And, and so we kind of classify everything as this this wilt. But wilt has always been a struggle with clematis. Yeah, and, you know, another uh, condition that you could add to your list there is that clematis wood can be very brittle, especially when the plants are young. And so often, if you come out and find that a a large section of your clematis has wilted, it's not the dreaded clematis wilt disease. It was damage from a pet, you know, running by or uh, any number of things. You know, just the smallest amount of damage can cause a whole stem on your plant to wilt back. And like I said, when those stems are young, they are... Quite, they can be very, yeah. very brittle and sensitive. So they're socializers. They like to be in the spotlight, but they've got kind of a fragile personality. A, a little bit fragile, yeah. Yeah. They yeah. have specific needs. They're high maintenance. They're not high maintenance like in the way that, you know, most people think of like a topiary or something that you're always out there trimming and clipping. But um, they, they, they need their conditions met to perform. Yes. So a little bit of a diva. But, but worth Well it. worth planting. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I agree. Now, one myth that people will ask us about with clematis, and I've heard this from the start in the garden center industry, and that is people will dump lime on the plant. Don't do it. And don't do it. It's a myth. As a matter of fact, I was looking at the specs on Sweet uh, Summer Love, and it said the pH should be right around 5.5 to 6.5, somewhere in that area. Do yeah. you agree? Yeah, I would say certainly no lower than 5.5. Right. Uh, generally speaking, clematis do not like a very acidic soil. Slightly acidic to slightly alkaline if you're okay. around neutral. That's great. You know, I think so often when people think of plants that, that are very particular in their needs, they do think, oh, it needs acidic soil and it needs this and it's that. It doesn't. It actually can can do very well in neutral to slightly alkaline soils. But definitely do not put lime in an attempt to overly acidify the soil. That is not necessary. I agree. Now, I was doing some reading, uh, Stacy, in social media and Tim Wood here at Proven Winners, yeah. Color Choice Shrubs. Uh, was talking about clematis and talking about finicky clematis uh, varieties, but he recommended choosing, again, easy-to-grow varieties like the varieties you find here with Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, like Sweet Summer Love. Uh, he says the plant will make you, uh, make you a hero uh, because, again, he states pruning is simple. Treat it like a perennial, cut it back to two feet when it's dormant. Uh, the only drawback is that it does 
take a little bit of time to get established. Would you agree with that? Yes. And that goes back to what I was saying about the roots. When you, if you, and you can look up a picture and I would encourage you if you're having trouble envisioning the weirdness that is a clematis root mass, um, they're so thick and so fleshy that it just takes them physically longer to develop the root system. You know, it's not like, oh, it's just a little hair root that's, you know, this many cells. It's a big, thick, fleshy, ropey root. And as such, it really needs a lot more time to grow that Mm -hmm. and to get established so just that alone you you've you've got to be patient with clematis that's a that's a great explanation and and speaking of roots by the way um let's have you answer my question from the outset here on words when you go on a trip is it a root or a route i say root root good so do i root no i say route (laughs) <laughs> so you, if you were going to take the classic American road trip, you would be going down Route 66? Yes, I'd be going down <laughs> Route 66, not Route 66, or call leaf flower or call a flower. I mean, you could go on and on as far as these pronunciations are concerned. I need to drop that. I need to quit talking and just start planting <laughs> uh, is what I, what I should do. By the way, Stacy, why would you want to prune a clematis in the first place? If this is such a big issue... You know, I mentioned my group four. Why would you want to prune in the first place? Well, the number one reason you would want to prune your clematis is to get flowers from top to bottom. So if you don't prune them, the plant's not going to die. It's going to be just fine. But typically what will happen then is you're only getting flowers at the tips. So wherever that new growth started, that's where it's going to flower. And if you prune it back and it puts its energy into fewer buds, you are going to get that look that you see so often online when you're looking at pictures on Pinterest or anything like that, where it's just a solid sheet or mass of flowers. So that's the main reason. It, It is an aesthetic reason, not a plant health reason. So the key is give it time to grow, hot spot or a good sunny spot with cool roots, and uh, we should be good to go. I think so. I hope so. All right. Well, coming up next, we'll talk more clematis or clematis. That's coming up here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. Now, Rick, I often say uh, that our goal is to simplify gardening. That's why it's called the Gardening mm-hmm. Simplified Show. And I really hope with Clematis that we're not overcomplicating or making people <laughs> think that it's more complicated to grow than it is. It's not complicated. It's really no more complicated than any other shrub or plant that we talk yeah. about on the show. It's just specific in its needs. Yeah. And I, I was just thinking the same thing, Stacey. I'm thinking maybe I overcomplicated that a little bit in the first segment. But, you know, we love the plant, so we want to enjoy it. Well, that's true. And, you know, all you just all you need is to just know a little bit about these specific uh, requirements that it has to actually thrive. And, and you can be successful. And I think that's what's really exciting and rewarding about gardening is when you internalize this kind of information and say, okay, I want a clematis. I know it has these little bits of of quirks and weirdness mm-hmm. to it. and uh, But I, I understand how I'm going to meet its needs and I want to be successful with it. And speaking of quirks, uh, this plant is in the same family. It's a member of the same family of peonies, buttercups, hellebores. Interesting. And that family name, Stacy, is? The Ranunculaceae. Thank you. That's that a fun what one? I was going to say. <laughs> did, did you know that it the name Ranunculaceae derives from the Latin for frog? I did not know that. Well, now you do. Yeah, I think it's because of the, as I recall hearing, um, it might be because of the buttercup foliage. I, I'll, I'll have to refresh mm. my memory on that. But the Ranunculaceae has a lot of great plants in it, yeah. including clematis. Um, and today's plant on trial. So we're going to talk about one of the proven winners, color choice shrubs, how you can grow it. And then it's up to you if you're going to add it to your garden is pink mink clematis. Love it. Isn't that a fun name? Fun name. Well, that's the reason that we called it Pink Mink is because it's a uh, cultivar name given to it by its breeder in Poland. I'll, t- I'll talk a little bit about that if we have time. Is Krakowiak. And we felt like that wasn't really a name that was doing this beautiful, even though it means Krakow in Poland and has a lot of significance to the breeder. A lot of Americans would say, what? Uh, so Pink Mink it is. And the other reason I wanted to pick this, we, we started touching on Clematis Wilt. And clematis wilt is an actual disease as well as something that we can 
can be caused by a number of cultural conditions. Sure. But if you have had clematis wilt before and you're concerned about it repeat, reappearing, smaller flowered clematis like pink mink are far more resistant to the disease than the larger flowers. And most people, when they plant clematis, they get those really big, you know, colorful, bright flowers. That's the most popular kind. Stunning, exactly. Yeah, and who could blame them? But these kinds, like pink mink, that are smaller, have smaller flowers. It's also a bigger plant. So this is a plant that's going to get to be about 9 to 10 feet, you know, tall, Mm -hmm. but also kind of wide. It's always hard to talk about sizes on vines. So pink mink is a great choice for covering a fence a larger area like that. And what's so fabulous about it is it's um, pink flowers are bell shaped and they're on fairly relatively long stems for a clematis. Okay. So when it's covering your fence, it's just this curtain of dangling pink bells that is just incredible. Wow. Truly, you know, truly beautiful. What pops into my mind when you talk about the small flower and big flower is uh, sweet autumn clematis. And that is a small flower, small flower also. And that plant almost, I have found, can almost become invasive. It can be. It yeah. is very often invasive. Um, and the interesting thing about that uh, is you said that's clematis turnifolia or... So we have so there is a an invasive sweet autumn, and then there is also a sweet autumn type of clematis that's actually native uh-huh. that you will see when you go out there. So when you're out in the woods, I've certainly seen it plenty hiking here in West Michigan, and so it's important to understand the difference. Okay. So that if you are out in the woods and you're like, oh darn it, one of those invasive sweet autumn clematis, if it's actually our native, you wouldn't want to pull that out. But yeah, okay. sweet autumn is your confidence builder. Uh-huh. If you feel like you right. can't grow clematis, start with a sweet autumn or start with pink pink because yes. this is also a very, very easy one to grow. And, you know, with Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, our goal is always to have plants that outperform everything else on the market without having to, to do a whole lot more work or be more effort on the pe- part of the people who grow them. So when it came time to add clematis to the line, um, it was a tough. It was a tough choice. You know, we really needed to find plants that were beautiful, but also easier care that took out a lot of this mystif- you know, mystifying, weird stuff that gets people so confused. Right. And you know what has people also confused? Why is there a vine in the Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs line? Do you know why? No. Okay. Well, because you got to read between the vine lines, <laughs> the vine print, the vine print. Exactly. <laughs> well, so there are two different types of clematis. There are herbaceous and woody clematis okay. out there. So herbaceous clematis are going to die back to the ground completely, like an a perennial, and so that would be like the proven winner's stand by me uh, okay. clematis. That okay. comes from our perennial partners, Walters Gardens, down in Zeeland, Michigan. Here. The woody ones come from us because they're more like shrubs. They actually develop real wood and they create that woody base that you are cutting back every season to get that, you know, nice full display of flowers. So they aren't shrubs, but they are multi-stemmed woody plants. So they fit neatly into the kind of products that we sell and also along with care. So Pink Mink uh, was, uh, came to us from Poland. And I don't know if you know about the history of Poland and clematis. It's fascinating. Um, I I could probably spend the whole rest of the hour talking about it, but I won't because I know this probably only interests a very small handful of you. Um, But uh, so there was a gentleman by the name of Brother Stefan Franzak, and he was around. He was active in the early 20th century. He was appointed the gardener at the monastery where he was serving as a monk and fell in love with clematis and started breeding them. At the same time, the Iron Curtain is starting to come down. So trade is really starting to open. And so many of the clematis that we enjoy in the U.S. now actually began with Brother Stefan Franzak. Wow. So I love that. Stuff. Polish Spirit is uh, one that he created. Um, basically, almost any of them that have a Polish name, except for the new ones, started with Brother Franzak. And I'll put some links, of course, in the show notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com so you can read more about this. But um, Brother Stefan Franzak passed away. His work was picked up by a plant, a plant breeder and nurseryman, Stefan Marzinski. I would like to meet him. Oh, he yeah. looks like he a came fabulous here. person. <laughs> he was yeah. here visiting once, and yeah. uh, you know he's very serious mm-hmm. about his work. But he has developed some beautiful clematis, and mm. pink mink is one of them, as well as sweet summer love, which Rick mentioned earlier. So there's just this really rich history of uh, them, you know, being developed in Poland. And so pink mink is one of Stefan's uh, creations. He lists it as one of his best clematis for beginners on okay. his own website. So that's another really good. Sign 
sign that of all of the clematis you could try, this would be a really, really good one to start. Again, especially if you want to do something like dress up a chain link fence. Right. Or you have like a, a, a larger deck or something that you can... A mailbox. A mail, so I think I think Pink Pink might be a little bit big for the mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you have a very large mailbox, in which case you might want to stick with something a little bit smaller. Um, but it, it's also, like I said, very easy to grow. So this is one that we recommend cutting back to about 18 inches to 2 feet every spring. And like we said earlier, you know, pruning clematis is not something you do for the plant's health. It's something that you do to get the aesthetic result that you want from the plant. right? And in this case, that is flowers from bottom to top. You don't want them just way up at the tippy top where you can't enjoy them. Um, but I think a lot of people, when we say, okay, this is a big plant, it's gonna reach you know nine to 10 feet wide, but cut it back to two feet every year. They're going, well, how in the world is this thing ever gonna cover my fence if I'm cutting it back to two feet every year? And the answer is in the roots. We've talked already a lot about the clematis roots. Yep. This is not true just of clematis, but of pretty much all shrubs and perennials. You can think of the roots as like an engine. And the bigger that root mass becomes, the more fuel it has to drive the growth that subsequently comes from it. So basically what happens is, Every year as your plant gets more established and you are reducing the amount of top growth, that engine is still the same size. And yeah. so it's putting all of that fuel into growing that plant. And as that gets more established, it will easily be able to just go right back to that nine to 10 foot um, you know, size by the end of the season. And you don't have to worry about cutting off flowers because once it starts growing, Pink Mink is going to bloom on new wood and old wood. So you're preserving some old wood flowers as well as getting the new wood by cutting it back. And so really that's another place where the roots are so, so crucial is making sure they're healthy to drive that growth so that it's recovering vigorously every year from sure. that pruning. If we have all that foliage and all that growth as the plant, sh uh, plant shuts down in fall, uh, of course, we're feeding the roots and the roots continue to establish. And yeah, that ensures uh, beautiful blooming for, for future years. Stacy, I was reading uh, the genus Clematis was first published by that guy who got us organized, Carl Linnaeus, right? Yeah. Uh, but the plant was around long before that, and it said uh, in classical Greek, uh, the name is based uh, on the meaning of vine or tendril, oh. is what I saw. So I didn't know that. Yeah, so once again, a fabulous vining plant for your landscape. It is, and you know what? There is so much to talk about when it comes to caring for clematis, not because it's complicated, but because it's specific. And so we are going to distill all of this for you at GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com because I know there was a lot. We didn't get to touch on nearly enough of it. I didn't get to fertilizing, planting, all of that good <laughs> stuff, but I've got it all together. So visit us online to get all of that information. And uh, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we'll be answering your garden questions. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. One of the ways that we simplify gardening is by answering your garden questions, and now it's April, and I'm sure people have a lot going on out there that they're wondering about, so uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com or just email help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, and we will answer your question on air like we're going to for uh, for these folks. Who's asking us questions today, Rick? Well, we have no questions today. Oh. April Fool's. <laughs> yes, we have plenty of questions. Let's start with Jean. Jean says, do you have Japanese beetles in your area? If you do, how do you manage them? I live in Illinois and have given up on cannas because of the beetles. Wow. That would be sad. Not the rock band. <laughs> Japanese beetles. Yes. Yes. So we do have them here. Rock band. <laughs> Here comes the pun. Da, 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 da. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Actually, they did have a song about Japanese beetles. It oh, was, yeah? Hey, chewed. You know, because they chew up your... I thought you were going to say get back. <laughs> Don't make it back. Get back. That's even better. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Very good. I thought hey, chewed was good, but get back is even better. Boy, you know, it is frustrating. And I have found with my cannas, too, that the Japanese beetles in the heat of summer will really go after them. Oh, really? Yeah. And I think the key 
And, and they'll make Swiss cheese of the foliage. The key is with Japanese beetles is once they have started the attack, it's almost like they send out a signal mm -hmm. that says, hey, everybody else, come on in. It's a party, you know, yeah. and they trash the place. And what you have to do is you have to keep that from happening. So I have found with my cannas, uh, Stacy, that I need to spray them with neem mm -hmm. or spray them with insecticidal soap. Something along that line, uh, many of your Japanese beetle sprays will be pyrethrin-based, uh, but spray them before the attack begins. Once the attack begins and the foliage starts to become Swiss cheese, it just builds on itself and gets worse and worse. Now, sometimes on the cannas, what will happen is they focus on one leaf, mm. and you can prune that leaf out, spray, and then you can uh, divert the attack. So uh, very, very frustrating. Yeah, that is. And, you know, plants, when they have been chewed, they literally do emit a sort of distress signal. There are yeah. hormones, rescue hormones that the plant starts producing. And insects, being opportunists, start pick up on that. And so it's true that they, it's not that the in, the beetles are sending a message to each other like, hey, delicious canna leaf over here. Right. It's that the plant's like, help me, help me. And the bugs are all like, <laughs> oh, I'll help you all right. Um, so it is very important to, to, to avoid that in the first place. And, you know, all of the um, treatments that you just mentioned, you know, less toxic. You don't, they're not harsh chemicals. Right. Soap is a great choice. Right. And so, but it is really important to be proactive about exactly. it. Exactly. And it, I am a big fan of, well, not a fan as in I enjoy it, but um, I am a hand picker of Japanese mm -hmm. beetles. Adriana, our producer, is laughing because she's seen me do some numbers on Japanese beetles. Uh, <laughs> I don't, oh, I, I don't think too. she's, as, I think, I don't think she is as unsqueamish about them as I am. But um, yeah, I mean, I'll just chop them in half with my thumbnail. Oh, yeah. I do a Japanese beetle dance. I throw them and, and I dance. Yep, and, that works Oh, too. yeah. Cool Whip container with soapy water. And you know what's really cool uh, also and for Gene is plant some geraniums around also. When they get on the geraniums and they eat some of that foliage, they almost become paralyzed like for oh. about a half hour. And that makes the picking really? easy also. Yeah, so geraniums can be helpful too. There's, you know, there's all sorts of methods. Of course, sometimes I'll go out there with a shop vac too, but you have to be trained and you have to practice because if you use the shop vac and you get a little close closer to the foliage than you should, you do more damage than the <laughs> Japanese beetles would have. And of course, you have to use your shop vac in the garden judiciously, lest the neighbors wonder <laughs> what the heck you're doing. And along the same lines, though, as Rick said about the Japanese beetles eating the geraniums and slowing down, if you get out there early in the morning, they're pretty sleepy. Yeah. And that's a really easy time to just take them off by the handful as well. And you know, it feels like a losing proposition, but every single time you take out a female Japanese beetle, you have removed Exactly. exponentially more exactly. down the line. So I, I truly do believe that everyone counts. So you have to be proactive. Yes. Proactive. I think that that's a great point, Stacy, and that's why I spray them before the attack begins. Like start spraying around the third week or June uh, mm. of June here in Michigan is, is what I do. And then uh, I'll pick up a Japanese beetle trap and uh, set that up in my neighbor's yard to send the Japanese beetles. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> just. If you are going the trap route, more is better. So make sure all your neighbors yeah. have them, not just you, not just one neighbor. Everyone has to participate. Yes. <laughs> all right, let's take a look here. Paul has a question. I'm going to get a uh, get compost going for the first time. We purchased a tall plastic square barrel type. I'm having trouble understanding the ratios needed and how precisely to measure the mixture. Can you help me with this? That's a great question. It's such Paul. a good question. And so basically what Paul's talking about, if you're not familiar, is that compost, when you're making it yourself, is comprised of green material and brown material. Mm -hmm. And the green material is like it sounds fresh stuff. So food scraps would count as green you know, fresh weeds, anything like that, trimmings from fresh green plants would all count as greens. Browns are the carbons. And so that is things like old dead leaves, you know, any kind Could of dead straw, brown tissue, pine needles, straw, something anything like that's that. brown. So basically mm -hmm. the green and brown does correlate in a very direct way to the color of the material. You can also use, not that anybody has newspaper anymore, but you can use yeah. black and white newspaper for, for the browns in your compost as well. So to get a good compost growing, you want a ratio of about two to one browns to greens. So you want about twice as much brown 
as you do green. And this is not something you need to worry about measuring by weight or volume. Just eyeball it. Right. And this is, again, this is a best practice thing because by following that ratio, what you're going to do is get the optimal conditions for rapid decomposition. So if you have too much greens, it's going to be kind of slimy, but it will still decompose. And smelly. And smelly. If you have too much browns, it's not really going to go anywhere. Nothing's it just kind of happen. sits around looking brown. Um, but again, this isn't scientific in terms of how you do it. Just, you know, what I like to do, is, and you and I have talked about this before, Rick, stockpile autumn leaves in the fall. Yep. Um, as you're coming into the spring now, any like old perennial clippings and stuff like that that you're taking out, and people are going to have leaves out again soon. Um, you know, st I stockpile those. And then whenever I do start getting a good layer of greens going, I'll just dump some browns on and and do it that way so yeah. i keep it pretty simple but you know try to aim for that two to one have some brown available to at least equalize every layer of green you have because it's a lot easier to get the greens than the browns yeah and i'm with stacy uh you know eyeball it eyeball it it's not rocket science you have to maintain your composture here and uh, I have seen, Stacy anything from two to four parts brown to one part green. Mm -hmm. But I'm with you. If you go that two to one ratio, it's going to be pretty easy to eyeball it. Yep. And don't forget to keep it moist. And this is the compost yeah. lesson I have learned, not keeping my compost pile wet enough. Um, so, it's again, it's not complicated. It's not hard. You don't have to make it more difficult. You just have to be patient and, uh, you know, have, have the browns ready. The stockpile of browns, I find, is the most crucial element to successful composting. I agree. Alyssa sends us a note. Hi, my husband and I are currently building a house, zone 6A. We have to put some of our fruit trees and bushes into pots until I can plant them in the ground. So my question for you is what's the best potting mix to use? She has apples, plums, pear tree, blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, strawberries. She's going crazy trying to research what type of soil would be best. And my answer would be I wouldn't worry about the soil so much, in my opinion, if this is a temporary resting place for these plants. I'd be more concerned about the pots and whether or not the pots have proper drainage. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. yeah. You know, people do worry a lot about different types of potting mixes. You know, we often recommend that people grow shrubs in containers and they say, oh, well, what kind of potting mix should I use? And the simple fact is that pretty much any of your standard bagged potting mixes at the garden center are going to be just fine. Mm -hmm. They're really, you know, the benefit to using them in containers is that they're fast draining. And that's what's really key, you know, aside from the drainage in the containers themselves, which yep. of course is crucial. Mm -hmm. These potting mixes, they hold on to moisture, but not a lot. They have nice big pore spaces in there that fill with water, moisturize the plant, and then drain out so that you're not getting heavy, wet conditions, which is the death knell for anything, whether it's a fruit tree or your annuals or houseplants or whatever that is. So I honestly, any good fresh bagged compost or potting mix that you can buy at your garden center is going to be perfectly fine. You have quite a lot, so I would say whatever you can get a good price on is, I agree. <laughs> is also recommended. I agree 100%. Uh, I think the key is drainage in the pot and then maybe sinking the pots into the ground a little bit temporarily so they don't blow over. Yeah. Because if they blow over, then you're not going to be watering those plants properly until you can move them to your new home. So there you go. Yep, so simple, easy peasy. All of this will be on the show notes at Gardening Simplified on air.com we've got to take a little bit break a little you've got to take a little break but when we come back we've got branching news so please stay tuned okay my friends it's time for branching news not breaking news but branching news here on the gardening simplified show and we'll put this survey at the website gardening simplified on air.com because stacy Gardeners love to host and get together and have dinners, a garden party. And I looked at this survey and it was fascinating. Putting on a dinner is stressful for people. As a matter of fact, the top five things less stressful than holding a dinner at your house are catching a plane before the gate closes, dropping a phone, passing your SATs, leaving your phone at home, or spilling a drink on a white shirt. What? According to this. There sir. is nothing more stressful than catching a plane, <laughs> you know, honestly. <laughs> well, in this case, we're all dressed up and no place to grow. That's the uh, situation. Wow. The top five things dinner hosts stress over 
because you want everything to be absolutely radishing, is how much food to prepare, how clean is your home, figuring out how long it's going to take to prepare the food, if your guests will like the food, and then finally, if you'll have enough food for everyone. So evidently, this is a, a stressful thing for people. It's a wonder people hold dinner parties at all if they're that stressed about <laughs> I love to cook. I love to cook for friends and family. So, uh, you know, I honestly have to say for, for me, I can't relate. Like yeah. I do stress about, well, am I making the right thing? Will people like it? But um, overall, like, I don't know, it's just, it's just great to be able to cook for the people you love. Yeah, That's exactly. Especially rosemary. <laughs> Eat, drink, and be rosemary, right? Oh, that was bad. <laughs> okay, I'll move on. No, I'm sorry. I just had an image of my, you know, rather <laughs> sad rosemary in my garden right now. Uh, it did survive here in Zone 6, but uh, it's, it's, it's not... <laughs> Not looking like the happiest gal at the dinner That's party. True. Let's put it that way. That's true. Rosemary does not like winter. So thank goodness spring and summer is on the way. The National Park Service, uh, the cherry blossoms in Washington. And by the way, in, in Washington, D.C., I love the history of the cherry blossoms in Washington, D.C. Just fascinating. Uh, but in the news this past week, uh, this past weekend, because traffic backups for just mm. miles and miles, people don't. Re and, and why aren't they just using mass transit to get there? I mean, that's what I would do, but I mm, don't know. But boy, the traffic jams. In the National Mall, people, they say people just kind of going in circles, trying to find a, a parking spot. Oof. So very interesting. But Hard to enjoy that way. You know, the, the, history, uh, the history of these cherry trees, you think about President William Howard Taft, and it was the First Lady, Helen Taft, who liked to visit Japan, and she was like, Boy, these cherry trees would be great. And so she was she was fantastic in, in getting this off the ground. Of course, the first go-round, the trees came into Seattle, were sent to Washington, D.C., and they ended up having to burn them all. Yeah, I heard about because that. Because of bugs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and infestation. That had to be a tough call. But they tried again, thank goodness, and uh, that was great. I was reading a newspaper article uh, from January 29, 1910, and it mentioned they kept about a dozen of the buggiest trees. That's their wording here. And they were saved for further study and planted out in an experimental lot where an expert entomologist mm -hmm. with a dark lantern, a butterfly net, a cyanide bottle, and other lethal weapons will be placed guard over the trees. Oh, my goodness. This, Can this, you this picture is quite that? an image. I, I've got something in my head. Woo. Cyanide bottle. That's Just. scary. <laughs> <laughs> we'll also post an article at the, uh, the website, Gardening Simplified on Air, uh, that I thought was interesting from the Washington Post about how people who are gardeners are more observant. They acquire something they call gardener's eyes. Believe it 100%. I do too. I really do. We tend to uh, appreciate and assess and look with wonder at what is unfamiliar and uh, whether it's the petals of a flower or the pollinators. Uh, you know, of course, beauty is in the eye of the be beholder. Uh, but this is really interesting, and I buy into it, too, so I thought it would be a great thing to post at the website. Well, you know, I, I do have to wonder, though, too, is this a chicken or egg kind of situation? Are people who are more observant more likely to become gardeners? Or do you develop oh. the observant qualities as a gardener? And I think, you know, obviously one thing kind of feeds into the other. But, you know, for myself, I know that, you know, gardening has is what made me love insects is, you know, being down there with them and really observing them in a very, very close way um, has completely changed the way I look at the world and at plants. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a great thing to be part of your garden and observing what happens. That alone is a great observation, <laughs> Stacy. That's fantastic. Hey, do you play pickleball? I have. I can't get on the courts anymore. It's too popular. <laughs> That's the point. The sound and disruption from pickleball, America's fastest growing sport, is driving some neighbors, tennis players, parents of young children, other people crazy. Homeowner groups across the country are looking at limiting pickleball play. It's a pickleball frenzy, the growth in pickleball. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, and I'm attuned to this because I'm a baby boomer or a baby bloomer, uh, and that is uh, they say that retirement planning 
is playing pickleball. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, so we don't live like super near pickleball courts. You can't see them. It's about maybe a five or six block walk from our house, but we can hear them. Oh yeah. So, you know, a nice, beautiful summer weekend morning, you wake up, the sun's shining in, your windows are open and it's like, padunk. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, it, it's not very enjoyable. Yeah, I, I the, will be the first to uh, admit that. The problem with pickleball is it starts out as fun. It starts out as fun. And never underestimate a baby boomer with a pickleball paddle. You know? <laughs> and have, have you played the game? I mean, it ha- there's a kitchen. Yeah. You know, and you can't get in the kitchen. And it's just... Yeah, I it's it's got its whole own rules and and you know, you go down there and then people are trying to tell you how to improve your pickleball game and you're like, "Listen, I just wanted to hit the ball around." Uh it's it, but yeah, like I like I said you can't even we got pickleballs for Christmas a few years ago thinking, "Okay, we'll pick this up." We can't even get on the court oh, now. Yeah. I mean, I it's know. just it's madness. There are courts by my house too and they're expanding the courts, so Anyhow, fun. I like pickleball. Don't get me wrong. It's just fascinating. And we'll put the link to the story once again at the, uh, on the website. So chickens and roosters all over yards and gardens on the roof in Phoenix, as I understand it. There are some neighborhoods there for years. Chickens and roosters have been roaming the neighborhood south of the Biltmore area, and they're multiplying. The city of Phoenix says they have not received any recent complaints, but the realtors are complaining because they're saying it's becoming a challenge to, uh, to sell a home. I guess the chickens were there first. There were farms in that area. The chickens have uh, stuck around. And uh, now you take a drive through the neighborhood and you'll find roosters, chickens, peacocks all over the yards, the gardens, the roofs. There's even chickens crossing the streets. Pure madness. So, um, boy, fascinating to think about that. Yeah, that sounds uh, that sounds pretty wild. No, or, but I mean, I, I think that people would be a lot more interested in them if they're getting free eggs. Yes. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And it makes for great jokes, too. I was doing some reading the mid-1800s in New York. It was the Knickerbocker magazine that started that whole why did the chicken cross the road thing. Yeah, yeah. And kids, you know, kids love those jokes. My grandson, Max, you know, he'll say, why did the chicken cross the road? And I'm sure it had its reasons. That's his punchline, (laughs) you know, or... Why did the chicken cross the playground to get to the other slide or because it was free range and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, yeah, the chicken cross the road jokes uh, are great there, but they're a part of our landscape and a part of our lives and neighborhoods and in Phoenix too. Another great thing about having chickens, we were talking about Japanese beetles. Mm -hmm. Oh man, chickens can do a number on not just Japanese beetles, but really any garden pest, insect pest that you have, slugs, Japanese beetles, other types of beetles, they love them. So and, free pest control. And Japanese beetles taste terrible. You, have you eaten them? Yes, they taste awful. On purpose? Not on purpose. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when you were running or something? You're working hard and you got your mouth open. I mean, it <laughs> happens sometimes and they taste awful. Why a chicken? I can see why a chicken would want to cross the road but not eat a Japanese beetle. <laughs> Well, they don't find them terrible. I have seen them abundantly help themselves to to Japanese beetles. So another benefit for all those people in that Phoenix neighborhood, free pest control. Stacy, a big thank you very much to Adriana Robinson, our engineer and producer who does such a wonderful job. Look for us on YouTube, the podcast, and of course on radio in West Michigan. Stacy, always a privilege and pleasure. Likewise, Rick, and we all hope you have a great week ahead. Hello, my friends, coming to you from Studio A at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. It's that time again, time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacey Hervella. I have no idea who I am. <laughs> See, I wasn't ready. And that other guy. 